Hey kiddos, I wanted to get in touch with you while we are apart and I thought a great way would be to do a little read aloud with you and I know you guys were psyched to read Capture the Flag who is by Kate Mesner and uh, what I figured I would do is read a chapter a day and you can log into your Google Classroom and watch the video and uh, maybe I'll even post a couple of questions there. You could even comment on what you what you heard in the story and I'll write back to you. All right, so here we go. Are you ready? We're gonna meet some new characters. There are three main characters in this story. One, two, and three, and I'll give you a little close up. There's one of the kiddos. There's another. And the third one. Okay, so you could try to figure out who's who as I'm reading. All right, here we go. This is a good book, you're gonna love it. <clears throat> Chapter one. They never should have unlocked the door. They never should have let them in. The party had already gone late in a blur of red, white, and blue bunting and orchestra music and fancy gowns and thin crispy crackers with caviar. The tour wasn't on the schedule. But Irma Emma Jones, the director of the Smithsonian Museum of American History, made curator Jeff Brody unlock the chamber one last time. We have a dignitary who's requested a private viewing, she said. But we've already secured the area, Brody's brow wrinkled as he felt personally responsible for each of the museum's 355,000 treasures of American history. The key is way down in the lockbox. This particular dignitary made a particularly large donation. He would like a tour for his group. The director looked over her glasses and handed Brody a clipboard. Brody sighed. He was tired of dignitaries. He never watched the news and couldn't care less about all the politicians and visiting heads of state who came through the museum. But he nodded and set off towards the escalator, weaving through women in ball gowns and waiters balancing trays of tiny cream puffs. Excuse me, the gala was so crowded he nearly had to climb over the three kids sitting on a bench next to the bronze statue of George Washington. The freckly-faced girl hovered over a purple notebook, her pen flying back and forth across the page. The skinny boy with the messy black hair held a thick paperback in his hands and nibbled on cookies from a napkin in his lap. Next to him, a sturdier boy with short cropped hair poked his thumbs furiously at a handheld video game. None of them looked up. Brody took the escalator to the basement security suite, buzzed the officer at the main desk, and entered to get the key. One more, he said. The officer grunted, ugh, took a bite of his meatball sub and looked up at the bank of monitors that showed every corner of the museum. Brody punched in the code, beep boop boop, opened the safe, safe and pulled out the key card. On one monitor, he could see the final tour group already gathered near the exhibit. Be back soon. Upstairs, five men waited all in black tuxedos. Two were stocky bodybuilder types. There was a skinny one who kept rubbing his bald head as if he had forgotten to put on his hair. A younger one who wore sneakers with his tux and a tall one who seemed to be in charge. His perfectly sculpted wavy brown hair made him look as if he'd stepped out of a shampoo commercial. Good evening, the tall man said when Brody arrived, and thank you. We are so looking forward to this tour. Brody's eyes dropped to his clipboard. Wait a minute, I have four on the clearance list, not five. Is that so? Because my good friend, your boss, I believe, assured me that whatever my group wanted, there would be no problem. The tall man nodded across the room where Irma, Emma Jones, was hugging the orchestra director. Over his shoulder, she nodded at Brody and flicked her hand towards the exhibit, motioning for him to get moving. So he did. 
He led the men past the charred piece of timber left behind when the British troops burned the White House in 1814, past wall panels that told the story of the siege of Baltimore just days later, past a real British bombshell, one of hundreds that fell that night, blasting shrapnel into Fort McHenry and right up to the polished silver punch bowl modeled in the shape of a bombshell and engraved with the name of Fort McHenry commander, George Armistead. To the right of the punch bowl hung a portrait of Baltimore seamstress, Mary Pickerskill. She had eyes that followed you wherever you went in the exhibit, right into the far shadowy corners. Brody lifted the lanyard with the key card from around his neck, reached over the top of the portrait's frame, and inserted the thin rectangle of plastic into a hidden card reader. When he pulled it out, a navy blue panel on the opposite wall slid to the side with a quiet hum, revealing a smooth steel door that looked as if it had never been touched. Not a single fingerprint smudged its cool surface. One moment, Brody punched a cold into a numeric keypad on the side of the door, then stepped forward and looked into an eyepiece. There was a series of high-pitched beeps, then a click from deep within the steel door's lock mechanism. Brody pushed it forward and stepped into a short hallway with another steel door at the opposite end. He motioned for the men to follow. That first door has to close. It thunked shut behind them, and immediately one of the bodybuilders began shifting back and forth on his shiny black shoes. <laughs> Claustrophobic? Brody asked, smiling a little. If we were attempting to break into the chamber, both doors would remain sealed now. The double doors from a, form a man trap. We'd be locked in this passageway until the police arrived. He paused, but of course, security is well aware of our tour. Brody punched in the code, stepped up to have his retina scanned again, and waited for the second door to open. In we go. He led the men into a cool, dark room. Your eyes will adjust in just a moment. The tall man stepped toward the table, his dress shoes clacking on the concrete floor. There she is, he whispered and breathed in a long, deep breath as if he could still smell the smoke from the battle drifting through the stars and stripes. So this is the actual flag that inspired Francis Scott Key to write the Star Spangled Banner? Yes, indeed. What a treasure. Is the preservation work complete? It is, sir, Brody said. He wished the man would step back a bit. He was breathing all over the stars. They won't be patching the rest? The man gestured toward a gaping hole where one of the flag's original 15 stars was missing. No, sir. At this point, the flaws are part of her history. The bits of stripes were cut away over the years and tucked into caskets by the widows of Fort McHenry's heroes. The star there, Brody gestured toward the hole, was supposedly given to an important person according to old letters. Some say it's buried with Lincoln, but we've found no evidence to support that. He took a deep breath of the room's cool, quiet air. At any rate, it's part of her history now. We won't be fixing anything more, just trying to prevent further damage. One of the bodybuilders stepped forward and whispered something in the tall man's ear, just as Brody's cell phone buzzed. The curator cringed as if the noise alone could pollute the pristine air of the room. He looked down to read a message and let out a sharp sigh. <sighs> if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'm being summoned to deal with an issue in the first lady's exhibit. Officer Lehew is on his way to escort you out. The steel door whooshed open once more, and a Smithsonian guard entered the room. She told me to get you there pronto, he said Brody, to, to Brody, reaching out for the clipboard. I'll finish up in here. Thanks, Paul. Brody gave a hurried wave and left the chamber. 
All right, gentlemen, have a last look, if you will. We need to lock down for the night. Paul looked down at the clipboard. Let's see, checking out a final tour group of four, correct? Correct, sir, the tall man said and turned briskly toward the door. And thank you. It has been a rare gift to see the flag up close. My pleasure. All set then? Four men followed Paul out of the chamber, past the silver punch bowl and the portrait of Mary Pickersgill, and she watched as they walked by the charred timber and the British bomb sh shell and spilled back out into the reception hall, where the crowd was clapping for the orchestra's final piece, and the champagne flutes were almost empty. The fifth man, the one whose name was never on the clipboard, had disappeared. So there was a lot of historical content in there. Things that you could look up, Francis Scott Key, the Star Spangled Banner, um, and maybe even Fort McHenry. I definitely know I heard some similes in there. Um, and I look forward to see what you type in and tell me that you heard. All right. See you tomorrow for chapter two. And maybe there'll even be a question that appears in Google Classroom. Keep reading, guys, at home and keep looking for Arthur's Craft. All right. I'm here with you in spirit. I'll see you soon. Bye.